on today's show, the Cavs small forward position just wasn't good enough last year. Let's explain why on a new episode for Monday, May 22nd. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. The music you heard on the way in is from our friends at Astro Radio. Check them out on Apple Music or Spotify, wherever you get your music. I'm Chris Manning. I cover the Cavs and the NBA for outlets like SB Nation, Cleveland Magazine, the Just Basketball Show, and more. That man is Evan Damerell, the founder of Independent Site, right down Euclid, covering the entire Cleveland sports scene. As always, we have Jake Stevens on production. Thanks again for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, segment one today, how the Cavs kind of had a hodgepodge of production at small forward last year. Segment two, what went wrong in the playoffs? What that tells us about that group in segment three, do the Cavs need elite production from that spot, aka reshape the roster, or could they get by with something closer to average and more balanced? But Evan, to start with this group. What a weird collection of guys. Isaac Okoro, who's very defensive first. Karis LeVert fits in here as well. We talked about him last week. Kind of not really a three in the way you would think. Dean Wade kind of didn't step up into that role the way you might have thought. Uh, you know, Lamar Stevens is there. Like, but you never had someone that really reached out and grabbed that spot. And it, it is the big weakness of the team. No perfect fits. None without weaknesses. That's a hard place to be for this spot. It, it is. Um, and to fully stress, I think just watching the playoffs and you watch such incredible production from the wing spot, whether it's LeBron, clearly, or Jimmy Butler, or Jason Tatum, or Jalen Brown. I mean, like, I know Michael Porter Jr. isn't a superstar, but he's like a star level scorer for the Nuggets. Like, he really benefits from Nikola Jokic's gravity and passing, but guys like that are commodities uh to begin with and they they're the ones that grow off the tree um like if you're sipping mint tea you'd be sipping like you know where it came from kind of situation but regardless the it's a premium thing and the calves are flawed at that spot like isaac Cora's shot never really materialized in year three lamar stevens is not a shooter dean wade shot abandoned him after the shoulder injury uh jetty osmond's wildly inconsistent you could lump danny green into this group but he's just such a short term addition. You can't count him for last year. But like looking forward ahead to next year, it's Wade, Okoro, um, Osman technically, um, and then there is also it's just those three that are coming off the top of my head right now. I'm sure there's others too, but like those are your core three guys, or Lavert as well. But Lavert is more malleable. Lavert's probably like back. Said. Yeah, he's He'll probably back. back, and we talked about that too um, last week. But regardless, like the Cavs need some form of production from the wing, especially if they're hell-bent and determined to play two bigs like they do. And in order to do that, you need shooting, which none of those guys really provide other than Osmond on a good night. And look, I I think we'll we'll get to this more in segment three, but it's like, I think even beyond like the real elite names we're talking about here, I think Bruce Brown level production, um, you know, like Max Struess level production, like there is lots of other, there are lots of other guys in these playoffs that are not the best of the best that are giving you a really good position on the wing at small forward. And I, and I think that just feels like the weakness. And uh, Okoro, who we're going to do a full breakdown of tomorrow, what his future might be, all that stuff, I think is like a really interesting way to view what this team is through a prism. This is someone who clearly held up defensively, had a year where like numbers-wise, you would be like, oh, he has improved all of this stuff. And then he gets hurt at the end of the regular season after the hits that shot in Brooklyn. And then you get to the playoffs and he's not trusted. And when he did play, you just saw teams ignoring him. And there wasn't, you know, whether it was the shoulder injury with Dean Wade or just him struggling for whatever reason, you know, Danny Green's older, um, Jetty just defensively kind of all over the place and also a very inconsistent offensive player. And just a core was like your former top five pick you're hoping works out. And then she's just kind of like, it's kind of clear that you didn't fully feel comfortable with him if you're the Cavs in the playoffs. And 
it, it is even if you had just gotten something I think a little more even than what they had I wonder how the roster just functions differently or if some of this just had, like if it didn't feel like such a hodgepodge it, it would be good yeah uh, a hodgepodge is a good way to put it and especially in the postseason you watched it, or at least we knew uh the Cavs didn't have a ton of faith in Isaac Okoro because one they started Karis LeVert over him even though their only win in the postseason against New York had Okoro in the starting five and LeVert coming off the bench and two Okoro not only was benched he was relegated to the very back end of the rotation um this is gonna hurt our producer Jake Stevens ears again but like Ricky Rubio was getting minutes before Isaac Okoro in the postseason against New York and Ricky Rubio is at least a shell of himself currently because of the uh recovery from his ACL injury so it's hard to really fully forecast it but Okoro to be fair did have to deal with the COVID like year for basketball but like has flatlined a bit in terms of production and maybe you're hoping Heading to next year, he's more of a respectable three-point shooter, but like defenses are going to leave him wide open until he makes them consistently, and he can't, especially when the games matter most. I am... F- I, I, I really like wonder how this season informs the summer a little bit, right? Like, you have the situation where this clearly just didn't work. And specifically, we'll talk about the, the stuff in the playoffs. But even in the regular season, it just never felt like there was trust in the spot. And I wonder what the communication is like between the coaching staff and the front office, what Kobe Altman thinks about that kind of independently on his own, him and, and all those guys. And I wonder how the players feel about this. I mean, Donovan Mitchell will be an interesting person to ask this about because he came from a situation where they didn't have, like the, one of the flaws of those Utah teams was that they didn't have they didn't have the wing that really moved the needle for them in the way they probably needed to defend some of the apex predators out west. But they had Royce O'Neal. They had Joe Ingles. Um, they, they had wings that were at least competent and hit threes and did their job. I wonder what, how he, like, for how he would view just this, like, group that just kind of didn't have an identity. At least the group he had before, like, had an identity that could kind of trust. But it, it, this group was, like, lacking just sort of any sort of feel and cohesion oftentimes. Well, they had cohesion. It was on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, but, e- but even then, it's like Okoro has it, but then like Jetty oh, is yeah. just like that's like fair. the whole group. I mean, the whole group. I mean, it doesn't have like an identity. Like all they all do different things and all have different strengths, but there's not like a unifying principle of of what you're getting in those wings. Well, it's good to have different options, but like there's not like a thing that sort of linked them all together in my mind. I think it's certainly telling because Dean Wade is naturally a power forward, Lamar Stevens is naturally a power forward, and the Cavs. Gave them off-season assignments, not heading this off-season, but last off-season. Um, like, hey, we need you to become more comfortable playing three spot, whether that's laterally, uh, defensively, of course, just because they're a defensive first team. But the, the Cavs gave them an assignment because they don't really have any depth on the perimeter whatsoever, just at the wing spot. Like, it, it's Karis LeVert, and your Donovan Mitchell point is interesting, at least, just because, like you said, he played with Royce O'Neal, he played with Joe Ingles, and... When Dean Wade was healthy and confident in his shot, you could see maybe a semblance of what worked in Utah because, like, the spread pick and roll stuff with, like, the use with Ingles is not, like, a playmaker, but a guy who can get easy, clean looks on the perimeter, take and make them. Um, it's now you're going back to the drawing board. And to your point about Kobe Altman, he stressed during his exit interviews that shooting is definitely something the Cavs need to prioritize and focus on, which, you know was refreshing to hear um, from just the, the, the lens of covering this team because it's like that's where they need the upgrade and shooting goes hand in hand with the spots on the wing. So we'll see how this offseason goes because it's such a premium commodity to begin with and how like the Cavs are going to be competing with all 30 teams on the open market and they're limited asset wise after acquiring Mitchell. So how they go about this without doing anything that's considered a dramatic shakeup will be fascinating to watch. Yeah, I just don't know if I fully believe that they're not going to do something a little more dramatic than what they posited, even though like they posited a certain way. But that's that's a conversation for another day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks to play. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projections, you win based on what you bet. You can win up to ten times your money in any entry. There's no competing against other people. It is just you versus the projections available. PrizePix offers projections on any sport that you watch. This includes the NBA, the NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, and many, many more. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It is that easy. They offer safe and fast withdrawals, currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. 
Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, PrizePix will give you $100. If you deposit $50, PrizePix will give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Thanks for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Every day, as we are going to be back tomorrow, diving in to Isaac Okoro season, what he was, and what his future may hold now that he is extension eligible. So make sure you tune in for that and subscribe so you don't miss it. Evan, the simplest way to describe what went wrong for the Cavs wings in the playoffs is that teams just did not respect them. The Knicks just decided, shoot whatever you want. And when, when opposing teams in the playoffs don't respect your wings, it makes everything harder. That, that, to me, was the glaring thing about this group coming out of round one. I mean, the only way they could get really respectable wings on the cheap is probably go to Magic City and ask what they got Lou Will down there. But other than that, yeah, it became glaring against New York, especially a team, at least with Tom Thibodeau, who is a sound defensive tactician. Um, and he really exploited the mismatches and weaknesses and probably Cleveland's youth and inexperience as well. But the Knicks had consistent answers on the perimeter um, when Cleveland didn't, whether it was R.J. Barrett stepping up or obviously um, Jalen Brunson as well. Even Julius Randle hit three-pointers, but that's more the four spot. But either way, like the, the, the Knicks were able to kill Cleveland in terms of perimeter shooting some games, even if defensively it was a bit of a grind sometimes. And those were the backbreakers. Those were the difference makers. And that's kind of what it crystallizes down to is the Cavs just were outgunned um, every step of the way, despite maybe having the more talented roster on paper. When you look at the playoffs, is there was there any of the wings? Or is there anything that they did that comes to mind that you feel like that felt like something you could build on? Is there anything anyone did that you're like, OK, this guy at least did this specific thing well in that first round series? Oh, we're just saying the first round for the Cavs. I thought you meant the grand scope of the playoffs. No, 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 no. Just, just the Cavs. Just what okay. did you see? You know, did you see Michael Cora did or Osmond or whomever? Is there anything someone did that kind of stands out to you? I think Osmond just providing you some type of juice in terms of three point shooting in game one was helpful. It's unfortunate that you weren't able to find that steady wave, and I think that's just been the the brief summary of Jetty Osmond's time in Cleveland since he's gotten meaningful minutes um, is just like he isn't able to be consistent from three-point range. And then in terms of Okoro, um, I questioned the defensive switch, but offensively it made sense, especially going into the garden. But I, I just think Karis LeVert is better suited as the first lead guard off the bench to just get those primary scoring opportunities and let him build in the rhythm and flow rather than having to share the ball with Mitchell and Garland to start the game. And, disrupting the entire flow like Cleveland overthought the process a little bit I think they found something that worked in game two and didn't really apply it to the remainder of the series and I don't think a lot of it was wing production I think a lot of it was Darius Garland finding his groove of course but the Cavs were at least to get some passable production from like Levert uh Osmond was good in game one Okoro was just an abject disaster and I think that's like just so frustrating because people hyped up his three-point shot so much leading into the season and how much work he put into it and that's just my primary take. What, what's yours? What, is, what have you taken away from just like re- re-watching, dissecting, chewing up, and spitting out this playoff series for Cleveland? I came away like going back and looking at it. And I look, he is limited. And we're going to talk about him more tomorrow. So this feels he, like he a tease a for tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. I look at Okoro and think that I, I think he like acquitted himself as well as you could have wanted in those. He cut. He was cutting. He, he has... Look, I think he was. I think there is something with him that, like, he hits that game winning shot in Brooklyn and then he doesn't play again the rest of the regular season. Really. He played like a couple minutes next game, but that was just like, then he's out and we don't see him again until the playoffs. That felt like it could have been a catalyst for something to me and like a way for him to just, like, that was just like this crescendo moment of he hits like, he, he gets a corner three late in a game and takes it and makes it. You get to the playoffs and I think like there was some of that momentum gets kind of lost. But I, I didn't think he made, like, crippling offensive decisions in the way, like, Lavert often did in, mm-hmm. as a decision maker. I think he, like, obviously better defensively than Jetty. 
I, I think Jetty obviously also a little more reckless offensively. Jetty would give you some of the, the heat check threes and things, but Okora was just like more dependable and was up for the physicality of it. Like he is a weird fit for some of this because teams will ignore him. And I, and like, especially when you have two bigs and you play a little bit and you play that way, it's hard to like exactly find the right role for him. I, I think like there are some limitations with him baked into what he is as long as teams are not respecting his three point shooting. But I think you watched him play, and I didn't feel like he was like swimming out of his depth. And if if there's a oh. part of that that I I think would give me some optimism about where this goes, that that's maybe part of it. Other than that, it's just I, you know, I Lavert is. We know what Lavert is. We know what Jetty is. I I think it's kind of clear. It's just like if there are going to be playoff caliber wings, it just doesn't feel like they're on this roster fully. Even in a chorus case, I think you are. You were looking elsewhere to remake this room in some way. Is is what I really came away feeling more than anything else. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think it, it made sense to bring Danny Green in in that aspect, but Green was just never fully healthy or probably fully acclimated to what Cleveland was trying to do on offense or defense as well, just because that's bigger staff's bread and butter. And at least on paper, Danny Green was your best three point shooter out of the bench, guys, at least in terms of consistency. And like the minutes Green gave you wasn't terrible, uh, whether it was the regular season or the postseason, but. Just from looking at the lens of Fakoro, and like you said, well, we'll dive more into this on Tuesday show, but his fundamental mechanics, like the shot and everything, like it isn't broken. It's just flat. It looks like he's heaving a medicine ball sometimes, and there's not a lot of arc to his shot to begin with. And it's just been like a stagnant development. Like, yes, there have been steps. Like you said, that shot against Brooklyn was arguably the biggest shot of his professional career. And it could have been like a launching point, but it just didn't result in anything. Because one, he got hurt against the Rockets a few days after that. And he was out for such a long time. And that just killed a lot of his momentum going forward. And it was certainly telling that JD wasn't willing to ride with Isaac, a guy who mm -hmm. hyped up all the time to the media about his defensive chops and how much he likes playing him and how reliable he is. And he pulled the plug entirely on the situation because, yes, he's, he's coaching to win at that point. And it's a balancing act of trying to find moments for player development and opportunities for him to grow and develop on this team. But you also are trying to prioritize the winning in the postseason. And it's just like an untenable situation to look at if you're Cleveland. And and then you look at Okoro and like Danny Green's not healthy. Dean Wade's shot wasn't there as we saw in pretty much any game he played after his shoulder injury. There's maybe glimpses of it, but it wasn't consistent. And then speaking of consistency, like Jetty Osmond's just too much of a wild card to like rely on on a night to night basis that it could kill you because you have just no depth at the wing spot and you're already overtaxing Garland, Mitchell, Mobley, and Allen. Like you have to squeeze blood out of a stone somewhere and JB wasn't able to get any juice at it, out of it. The last thing we'll say here is what Danny Green had like some minutes in the playoffs had like, I thought, you know, defended up pretty well against Julius Randall. Yeah. I he, would bring, I, I would bring him back next year. Like I, I would be comfortable bringing him back on like a minimum deal, at least to have that veteran guy around and that be at least like a way you would keep like a body in there and just mm -hmm. see if maybe another year removed from the ACL, he has a little bit more juice left in there. Mm -hmm. Also just like a locker room presence. I, I would be all for that. But would, what, what would you have interest if you're Cleveland and bringing back Danny Green for another, for another run around? Yeah. I, you, you need adults in the room, as you would say. And we were talking last week about like free agency targets. Like if the Cavs landed Grant Williams and Torrey Craig is like their quote unquote bigger wing signings. And they brought back Danny Green on the vet men just to round out this roster because they do have roster spots. Um, I wouldn't hate that just because you need that adult. You need maybe that calming presence, a guy that clearly there's some mutual respect between the front office, the coaching staff and the players can kind of act as that bridge between the coaching staff and players and get through messages that, Maybe it won't translate in the heat of the moment properly, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I just, I wonder what Danny Green wants to do. Does he want to go back to San Antonio and ride the Wemby wave? Or does he maybe want to try and play for a championship and sign with like a team like the Lakers, depending on what they do, or maybe they, he goes to like Miami or Milwaukee or like there's other options that are abundant for Danny Green. Maybe if he wants to chase another ring, I would understand that, especially because he is definitely past the twilight of his career, but I wouldn't hate that if that's like Cleveland's one of their like last signings of free agency like they get like another veteran or like upside development point guard either with a two-way or like on a cheap like hollow netto type deal and they bring back green on the vet men yeah that's that's not bad but obviously there needs to be steps before you bring data green back and you can't just like hang your hat and say like yep this is our answer because that's kind of what it felt like 
uh, after the deadline last year. A little bit. All right, so last last thing here. Do they need elite win production or would average suffice is how I kind of want to frame this. I think two things about this. have Number okay. one, I think if you could just get average, like above average, it would be a big deal that, that fits. I look mm-hmm. at like, I think Denver is a good template for this because... That's who I was going to go with. They The wings that they got in KCP and Bruce Brown. And Michael Porter Jr. as well, and he's improved a lot, especially defensively. But like in, in the, the the veteran moves they made on the margins in KCP and Bruce Brown, those guys fit really well with how they want to play and what they want to do. They fit well with Jokic. They fit well with Murray. And they take threes and they space and they, they're taking tough... Con- KCP in particular takes tough contested shots and is willing to step into those and make them. And he cuts and does all this stuff. Brown is really additive as a screener, as a passer. He's up to three-point volume this year in Denver. They identified guys that fit their system and are willing to play that way. And it really, really works. I also would think kind of hand in hand with this, you're not going to get like a superstar wing. Like let's say you got Royce O'Neal in a trade or something like that. Yeah. I think you also would need like a leap from Evan Mobley. Maybe this is where some of the playmaking and shooting from him can help loosen things up a little bit. And maybe some scheme designs can help loosen things up a little bit. I think Mm -hmm. like the average wing, if they, if they go and get wings that we like on paper and like fit on paper and the, and the basketball reference page says, Hey, this guy makes sense. This guy has the right skill set. I still think there are things you're going to need from your roster internally and the way you kind of design things up and, and run things to make it all kind of come together in a clear way. So it's interesting you note Denver. I think all four teams that are still fighting it out in the postseason, whether it's Miami, Boston, uh, Los Angeles, or Denver, sure, the Celtics and the Lakers aren't getting their threes and Miami's just getting absurd numbers from guys like Max Struess, uh, Caleb Ma- Martin. Max Stru- but like Max Struess would be the best small forward on the Cavs if you were on oh, the yes, roster today and would be starting. And I think that's more damning on the depth of Cleveland's roster than it is on just the quality yeah, Max well, Struess's he, play. I mean, he's also good. Like, that guy's good. Mm. Yeah, he's great. He's, he's great. He provides what the Heat need and also what the Cavs need. But just something I've noticed just kind of breaking down these games and just, like, looking at the statistics and everything else is, like, the, the, these teams try to play with one non-shooter on the floor at all times with with the lakers case lebron has the ability to be a shooter but like isn't like the most like reliable three-point shooter nor do you really want him to be because he's not being as impactful and like anthony davis can give it to you but he can't and there's pages that the Cavs could take from this where if they really zero in on depth on the perimeter and shooting on the perimeter and just use like cuts motions especially how denver does off ball screens and just methods to get guys open i think it would work because we talk about how evan mobley if he tightens up his handle or uses his passing chops a little bit more like really could unlock cleveland offensively because sure darius garland and donovan mitchell are still learning how to play off the ball one another but if those two were cutting or getting screens to get open on the perimeter and the defenses are collapsing on mobley or mobley's just acting as the offensive hub like he could really unlock this game because those guys are so quick and just hard to like keep track of. And I know like Jokic isn't like the most perfect one to one comparison just because Jokic is just an otherworldly talent. You, you can't, yeah, we can't compare anyone to Jokic. Like, but, like especially, the way, yeah. but the way the Nuggets utilize Jokic is something the Cavs could kind of apply to Evan Mobley. Like this well, you, season, Jokic averaged 75 passes per game and created nearly 25 points per game off of assists, where Mobley averaged 43 passes per game and averaged 7.2 points per game off of assists this se- in the regular season. In the playoffs, uh, Jokic went to 81 passes with 25.2 points per game, and Mobley dipped quite a bit with 46.8 passes, creating 4.3 per game off of assists. Like, there's something there. And I think it's always just been a part of Mobley's game where like he's willing to make the pass instead of taking three-pointers. And if he adds that to the repertoire, that's great. But there's a path that kind of like maybe mimic what these teams are doing in terms of just prioritizing shooting on the floor at all times and maybe just finding creative ways to get your shooters open instead of just basic offensive sets like that the Cavs can really utilize. Yeah, I think the Cavs need layers. And I, I look, I, I don't think Mobley... You know, if he's ever going to be close to what Jokic is as a passer and a hub, it's going to take some time. I think that the other way you look at this is like, do you have your guards coming off of more off ball screens, coming off of pin downs? Can, like, can you get a guard who can do more for you than stand in the corner? Like, that's what yeah. you like. Like, even with Dean Wade, he stands in the corner, stands at the three at the three point line. Doesn't like it's not a ton of movement. Like, you're not really there's no like off ball juice that I think really is emphasized by some of these other teams, and there's no layers with some of that. I think there are sets the Cavs run that are 
that have a lot to them and have a lot of punch to them. But it is not like things that are really like loosening things up for the other guys and kind of making defenses kind of get stretched. Um, like I, there are just little things you could do, I think, to make some of these deals easier. I also, I'm also really curious to see just kind of what they, you know, some of this will be what is actually available to them, what is not. I wonder if they at some point decide, like, if if there was ever like a, a way to adjust this roster, and say like we're gonna ch- kind of change the allocation of money, mm-hmm. you know, Jared Allen for a wing and a, and you get a cheaper center would be the way you would do that. And I wonder if I don't know if that's this summer that they pull that lever. Yeah. But that's a if you ever wanted to pull a lever and say we're going to swap twenty million at center for twenty million on the wing, that's the lever you would pull, and then you go find a center with your MLE or something, or, or get one back mm-hmm. in the trade if it's the right number. That's the kind of thing I think you're you're hoping for. I I also just like I would think it would help if like they made a bet on Dean Wade, and I think Dean Wade not being as bad as he was for his regular season would have been a really big deal for them. I think that would have given mm-hmm. you at least something that fits kind of what they do, but. It's it's a tricky spot to be. It is a tricky spot to be in. Um, like locked on Mavs host slash our boss Nick Angstack floated to us for the uh, mock draft show. Uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. in the tenth overall pick in this upcoming draft for Jared Allen. And like, if you're Cleveland, you have to consider it just based on maybe who's available. Like if you can grab Grady Dick, if you believe like okay, just your shooting upside, you grab that, or maybe you trade back a couple spots if you think Dick will be there, and you could get like. Heinrich Williams from the Thunder as well, or maybe you finesse Royce O'Neal with a few first as well. Like there's avenues and paths that Cavs could do it, and I think that's like the dramatic sweeping changes and the uncomfortable conversations that they may have to have. And to your point, like maybe they don't have it this summer and they kick the can down the road to next year if it's just another result of this. But one that'd be exercising futility too. Like you're playing with Donovan Mitchell's time here in Cleveland and kind of like really tiptoeing a line here. So there's a lot of layers to it, of course, but at the end of the day, like we talk about uh, earlier in the show about how Donovan Mitchell, like had a system low in Utah with Joe Ingles, Royce O'Neal, and just everything that they did with the jazz. And I wonder if you're Cleveland, if you are, you're not kicking yourself, but maybe disappointed pointed that Quinn Snyder was snagged by the Hawks because I think if Quinn Snyder was available and then Donovan Mitchell speaks so glowing of him publicly to the media like I think the Cavs would have to entertain the notion of firing JB and bringing in Snyder because Snyder's offensive system would work really well in Cleveland and then you obviously have to do like the 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 adjustments after the fact but I I'm still surprised the Cavs are trying to be a little bit more aggressive heading into this offseason to kind of maybe fine-tune and adjust what they have when they clearly have a big three established if you want to call it that and Mitchell Garland and Mobley and the NBA is kind of like pushing away from that like you can maximize that and maybe just turn that into more role players but like you said if Dean Wade can find a shot that gives you a little bit of something but it's still not enough yeah we will we will see where this all goes a big summer ahead for the wing position again tomorrow every day is Thank you for making us your first listen every day. And we'll be back tomorrow talking about Isaac Okoro, his season in full, and, and what his future might hold, because he feels like a, a piece that could go a bunch of different directions as early as this summer. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for his production. Back at you tomorrow. This has been your Lockdown Cast for Monday, May 22nd.